Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, our next speaker um, is not only a maker of games, but also of music and artware. And he is here to talk about uh, uh, sorry, playful writing and playful reading. Please welcome Cardboard Computer's Jake Elliott. Thank you. Nice. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about playful text. Um, first off, where I'm kind of coming from is um, I work on this game called Kentucky Route Zero, which um, I work on with two other guys at this studio called Cardboard Computer. We're a very small team, there's only three of us. Uh, and we've been working on this game, Kentucky Route Zero, for about six or seven years, maybe. Um, it's a kind of very slow-paced, um, kind of story-centric or tone-centric adventure game that has uh, a ton of writing in it. Um, and that's my main role on the game is I write the dialogue. And I also do some programming, uh, specifically do a lot of the programming around how um, the player interacts with text in the game uh, and other miscellaneous part menus and boring stuff like that. Um, so, let's see if I, okay. Yeah, so in Kentucky Route Zero, uh, it's set in Kentucky, uh, in the United States, and it's set in and around uh, this huge cave system called Mammoth Cave, which is the largest known cave system in the world. Uh, and then it also takes place on the surface highways. Um, you spend a lot of time driving around in an old truck with an old dog and having conversations with people. Um, it's a game that we've released kind of in a rolling process over six years. Uh, it's an episodic game, right? So there are five chapters, the last one of which is forthcoming early next year. And then also a bunch of these little spin-off pieces that we call interludes that we publish in between each episode, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so in the most recent episode of the game that we published, um, Act 4, we started kind of experimenting with some procedurally generated texts. Uh, so I'll play you a little bit of what this looks like. Um, these procedurally generated texts that get sort of folded into normal, our normal kind of conservative um, multiple choice based branching conversations. So this is one instance where these uh, procedural texts come up. Um, this is a tiki bar that's on a, an underground river. Um, called the Rum Colony, and in this bar, when you talk to the bartender, he'll offer you these uh, tiki drinks um, that are these like kind of really sweet cocktails. Uh, and this is all generated in real time. It's not exactly random, it's kind of more, I would say, chaotic. Um, they're deterministic systems that generate these different recipes for tiki drinks. Um, this is sort of what some of the data looks like that we pull from when we generate these tiki drinks. So up at the top, you see our, our template. This is the simplest uh, drink that the system can generate. There are several of these templates in there. Um, so in this case, one shot and then some liquor name, two shots of another liquor name. So these two spots where we have these liquor tags are referring to these tables of, of data that we've, that we've written that gets sort of, um, like I said, chaotically filled in there. And then we usually have um, several categories of of these uh, terms that can get filled in that we uh, categorize by their rarities, common, rare, and esoteric. Um, here's another example of a scramble template, as we call them in, in Act 4. So at th this moment, uh, the characters have come to the seafood restaurant along the river, or actually the seafood restaurant is on a, a lake uh, in Mammoth Cave. And here, one of the characters is trying to think of a, a takeout order to bring back to their boat for another character. And she can flip through this infinite menu full of all of these um, chaotic scramble-generated recipes. Um, so this one, you know, as you can see, there are, here's like several of the templates. This isn't even all of them, but um, they, can, they can get pretty complicated. They can have several terms in them where we're mixing adjectives and nouns and other sort of parts of speech. Um, and the combination of dozens of these templates with 
dozens and even hundreds of these terms um, combined to generate a sort of combinatorial explosion where suddenly there's so many possibilities um, that it's, even though it's very simple, it's just sort of randomly or chaotically substituting terms into a sentence, um, it starts to feel, uh, because it's so unpredictable and because the data set is so large, um, it exceeds what we can reasonably hope to, as individuals, ever read in our lifetime. Uh, and it starts to feel like uh, this sort of open, organic um, possibility space, even though uh, what's running underneath it is very simple and deterministic. Um, so in designing this particular system, uh, there's a lot of history, art history, that we could look back to. Um, for combinatorially explosive um, sort of text generators. This is a fairly old one from 1961. Um, sorry, these pictures are a little bit crunchy. Uh, but this is a piece by uh, Raymond Cano, the French uh, uh, novelist and poet. This piece is called 100,000 Billion Poems. And it's uh, basically 10 sonnets, so like Shakespearean sonnets are 14 lines each, right? Three quatrains and a couplet. Um, and so with 10 sonnets, with each line uh, sort of, if you randomly or by intuition recombine those lines, the total number of possible poems, the total number of possible sonnets you can generate is a one with 14 zeros after it, right? So that's 100,000 billion or 100 trillion poems. Um, so Raymond Cano was working with this group uh, called the ULIPO, which is an organization that, it has some sort of formal structure, and it's, it's still around today. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of it in, in the 1960s, and this was a uh, group of French writers who were interested in, in working with texts and generating texts using rules, uh, very playful rules. Um, so for example, this guy with the really great hair in the middle, uh, Georges Perec, um, is a poet, or a, a, a prose writer, who um, wrote using what we call lipograms, which a lipogram means uh, missing a letter in Greek, right? So he would write um, stories um, according to these kind of narrowly defined rules about um, avoiding using certain letters. So this is the English translation of, of one of his books, which was called uh, La, La Disparition, which means the disappearance. And um, in, the, in the disappearance, he didn't use the letter E at all. Um, which is very difficult because E is a very common letter, and in fact, it meant that his name couldn't appear on the cover of the book because George Perec has three E's in it. Um, in, uh, this is a, uh, an excerpt from the English translation uh, by Gilbert Adair, so that was kind of an interesting challenge also, like not only write a complete novel without using the letter E, but then to translate it into another language um, and maintain the spirit and, and qualities of the original, but still following the same rule. It's kind of an interesting sort of, I think, playful game-like way of, of writing, um, you know, in the sense that when we play games, we're following rules that have no real purpose, right? We're sort of like doing absurd things with absurd constraints imposed upon us. Uh, here's a kind of another, uh, God, this looks so crunchy up here, but here's another uh, uh, photograph, a diagram of, of Raymond Cano's um, 100,000 million, po 100, million poems, where you can see, so you, you basically, you buy the book, and then you yourself with a razor blade cut the, uh, the lines. Um, or, or maybe it's printed in a collection or something. You cut the lines in, into strips and then you can kind of fold them back. Um, when I was a kid, I had some children's books that were like this with animals, where you'd have like the head, the body, and the feet, right, of the animal, and you could kind of flip through them. So it's a similar, um, similar conceit. Uh, and modernist poets, 20th century poets, are no strangers to cutting up pieces of paper with writing on them. Um, this is a set of instructions from I think 1920 uh, by Tristan Zara, the Dadaist poet, um, for how to compose a Dadaist poem. This was published in a collection of Dadaist manifestos that he wrote. Um, so these are instructions about taking, take another piece of writing, cut it up um, you know, into sentences or into fragments, uh, throw them in a bag and shuffle them, pull them out and, and recompose them. Um, so generating a, a cut-up poem, which um, this is from 1920, but we saw a lot of cut-up writing later in the 60s. The, the beat poets, for example, used a lot of cut-up writing. Uh, William Burroughs and Brian Geisen and people like that, other kind of later modernist poets. Um, has something in common also with this game called Exquisite Corpse that uh, um, is really well known now as a 
Um, mostly we think of this, I think, as a, as a tool for generating visual art or as a game that generates visual art or drawings. Um, originally, Exquisite Corpse was, so in, in Exquisite Corpse, in, in case you haven't come across it, uh, in this, this um, drawing it version of it, you would fold a piece of paper and one artist would draw the top third and then obscure everything but the bottom sort of fragment of their drawing and then another artist would fill in another third and so on so that um, you're just sort of like connecting lines and strokes with whatever the, the edges of what the last artist drew, right? Um, Exquisite Corpse, though, began as a game for generating texts and the name comes from an early text generated by, I think, Andre Breton. Um, and in the original Exquisite Corpse, uh, rather than sort of following uh, edge fragments of, an er of another artist's work. Um, the, it was actually played a little bit more like the Mad Libs games or something where we'd have identified parts of speech, um, for, ex for example, an article, an adjective, a noun, a verb, and so on, and different artists would contribute some, some random uh, or some uh, subconscious or, or sort of intuitive word according to that part of speech and we would come up with a new sentence. Um, so you know, this is uh, essentially formally what we're doing with what we're calling scramble templates. Um, it's, yeah, like I said, it's, it's not at all a new idea or, or a particularly complex idea. Um, instead of calling them scramble templates, we could call them grammars. That would, that's kind of a more, um, more specific term for them and a more common term for them. Uh, here's a, a much more modern project, this is uh, Tracery uh, by Kate Compton, which is a, a tool and, and a framework for generating generative grammars, right? So this is, a, this is something that you would use to design uh, templates and to design databases, data sets, in order to uh, create poetry or something. A lot of people use this to um, create like Twitter bots. Uh, so here's an example of a Twitter bot made with Tracery. This one's called Auto Flaneur. Uh, by the game designer Harry, Harry Giles. And so this bot just generates directions for you. Maybe you could set a notification and follow one of these directions every time it came up and you were outside. Um, this is a bot to help you get lost. Here's another bot. This one's by Emma Winston. Also uses tracery. Um, and it, you know, it's generating uh, these images, but it's, it's generating them out of text and emojis. This is a collection of tiny art galleries. It's another kind of similar contemporary tool, um, although it uses a different system on, under the hood. This is something called Botnik um, by Jamie Brew. So Botnik um, started its life as this kind of interesting tool that Jamie was using to write, and now Botnik, I, I think, is um, less refers to this tool and, and more kind of refers to a collective of, of writers and humorists who are using this tool to generate texts. Um, so Botnik works uh, using the same technology that you probably have in your phone where it's like kind of auto prompting you with the next words that it thinks are the next most likely words you're going to use based on its memory of all the sentences that you've typed into it. Um, you know, so it sort of prompts you what it, what it expects you to use. Botnik gives you more choices than um, your phone probably gives you three choices. Botnik's giving you, I don't know, 15 or 20 choices here, um, although you can constrain that. And then also Botnik lets you feed it arbitrary text, so it's not just following um, what you as an individual are writing, but uh, you, can, you can feed it. In, in this case, I was playing with uh, some Seinfeld scripts that Jamie had loaded in there, so this is autocomplete based on Seinfeld scripts. Um, the Botnik uh, Collective are writing some really funny scripts based on this just by feeding it huge data sets of, of um, teleplays, so this is, um, their generated X-Files script. Um, so again, this is not completely procedurally generated. This is human guided using this really clever system that sort of gives you uh, a series of interesting options at every step that retains some of the logic of the original work since you never type directly, um, but it has a lot of flexibility. This is really like kind of a cyborg uh, you know, human computer fusion writing tool uh, more than like an, an intelligence or more than some kind of artificial subjectivity that you'd unleash on a, on a text. And then uh, I like this dimension of the project also that uh, 
Jamie would create these Yelp reviews based on other Yelp reviews that he found and then actually submit them to the site. So this is uh, based on negative, uh, using the corpus of negative Yelp reviews of the Space Needle. Um, Jamie posted a one-star review of the Space Needle. I got very angry for free at the top of the Space Noodle. Um, <laughs> and there's a, at the very bottom of this, I don't know if you can see it, um, but there's this really wild phrase, uh, after all these complaints, that is an iconic symbol of the structure of my expectations. <laughs> so that's a sentence, right? I mean, that's, that's sensible in some way, but it's, the more I read it, the less I understand it. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think it's doing a lot of work, uh, sort of just in my head, just sort of throwing different concepts together. Um, I wonder, though, if it's maybe a little bit dangerous uh, for us to uh, allow computers to feed us these like, bizarre philosophical claims. It might be, might be something that we regret later. Um, this is a game designed by Yoko Ono in 1963. Um, this is a game you can play by yourself next time you think about it. And you can play it in Bergen. It's hard mode. Um, this is a game called City Peace. Here's another game by Yoko Ono. This one's even more difficult. Um, make a key, find a lock that fits. If you find it, burn the house that's attached to it. <laughs> Those two are both from a collection by Yoko Ono called Grapefruit that she published in uh, 1964. Here's another piece. This, uh, like the kind of strange philosophical claim from the Space Needle Review, is, is doing a lot of work that's strictly in your head. Um, What's the sound of the earth turning? What would it mean for me to listen to that sound when uh, I, I can't really perceive that sound, right? Um, there's all of these pieces that uh, Ono wrote mostly in the 60s um, are what she called event scores or what a lot of people in that time in, in, in the um, kind of art movement she was working with called the Fluxus Movement uh, were referring to as event scores. Um, they're sort of just instruction sets, but largely impossible instruction sets. Uh, they work with a sort of ambiguity and looseness of meaning in a way that I think is really peculiar to text. Uh, it's, it's hard to be, it would be very difficult to be ambiguous about a concept like the sound of the earth turning in, in other media that didn't sort of treat concepts as directly and rawly as, as language does in this case. Uh, here's a famous example of this by Noam Chomsky when he was um, writing a, a book about sort of um, analysis of grammar and syntax. The sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Again, this is a totally correct sentence, but it, it means nothing. In fact, it kind of means less than nothing. E each word that you read sort of negates the previous word. And it means less and less as you go on. And uh, each word kind of takes us further from the idea of this text as a representation of something. Um, this is some work by one of my favorite artists, uh, Mez Breeze, who designed, I, I know this might be a little bit hard to read, I should have zoomed in on it a bit, but um, she designed this sort of speculative uh, fictional art programming language uh, that she called Mez and Gel. Uh, and this kind of work, it, if, if you can see it, the w one thing that she kind of commonly does is she'll insert, like um, up here there's a sentence about a Great Dane wailing, and there are all these little insertions of other sort of phonemes and other um, letter groups that um, suggest other possibilities of other words that she could have used in that moment. So uh, this language that she designed, Mesangel, is a language for creating ambiguities. Often one of her poems um, written in this language, uh, they, these poems often deal with very practical grounded things, but uh, sort of are just aggressively at every moment um, undoing your ability to kind of like fixate on a specific meaning or to kind of understand it as meaning a specific thing. And it also borrows from a computer syntax or a sort of small language uh, used in computer programming called regular expressions, uh, which are these little um, statements made in the specialized language that we use to search large amounts of text for matches. And the things that make regular expressions really powerful uh, is that we can find fuzzy matches. We can, we can sort of, uh, we can say, I want, uh, I want to find anything that looks like a phone number. We don't have to search for 
a specific number, but we can search for uh, phrases or groups of letters that have a certain shape. So um, Mez's insight was, what if instead of that being a reading process, you know, reading thousands of documents uh, to analyze, what if that was a writing process? This is a more recent work um, by Mez. This is called All the Delicate Duplicates. This is actually a game, like actually recognizable as a video game, um, something that she made with uh, Andy Campbell. Um, and this uses some of the Mesengel syntax that she designed, also mixed with some kind of more traditional uh, prose, um, but then also breaks it out into this is the sort of first person um, navigable, kind of surreal first person game. Um, breaks that language out and sort of turns it into this sculptural form um, that you can approach from multiple angles, like, like literally approach from multiple angles. Um, you can start reading it in the middle or at the end of this ribbon of text, and, and it gets, gets even more sort of confusing and spatialized even than this screenshot. Um, this is a, a really cool project. Here's the URL for it if, if you'd like to look at it more closely. So uh, Kentucky Route Zero, uh, by comparison to the use of text in, in um, Mez and Andy's game here um, looks a, a bit more conservative uh, formally, right? So we're using, um, there's this one linear uh, feed of text that you scroll. Uh, we're using multiple choices as the interaction paradigm, right, which is pretty familiar from the history of video games or um, the history of choose your own adventure books and so on. Um, we're also borrowing some kind of traditional formatting uh, rules from, um, like from the theater, right? The, most of the text is formatted uh, as though you're reading a, a script for a play, um, and including stage directions and stuff like that. Um, and g game uh, dialogue systems like this, or I, I shouldn't say the systems themselves, but the player's interaction with, uh, with a dialogue system that looks like this, um, I, I think there's a tendency am among players and critics to, and, and designers to um, evaluate the success or failure of something like this in terms of how much work uh, something like, uh, how much work a system like this is doing to uh, guide the plot or to give the player a, a chance to be strategic and make decisions. So we hear about good game dialogue um, being about giving the player interesting or compelling choices or giving the player difficult choices or something like that. Um, and we have some of those, like for example, when this character asks this other character which of his parents wouldn't allow him to watch television, this is an important choice that um, you know, it may not guide the plot in obvious ways, but it fills in information about the the character that's sort of, sort of very important about his relationship with his parents. Um, but I think we also really benefit in this game from keeping some looseness or some slack. Um, or I had this old truck and the steering wheel was really loose and you could kind of move it a lot before it sort of kicked, it had like three or four degrees of rotation or something that was just completely free and did nothing to the steering of the car. And, and that's called having some play in the steering wheel, right? That kind of looseness or slack. Um, so I think we'd really benefit from having that extra play in the interactive text, asking some uh, questions of the player that don't survive this specific moment um, where this character asks another character um, what was his old favorite rock. Um, or in this case, uh, we ask the player to hold up half of a phone conversation without ever telling them what's being said on the other end. So, you know, we give the player a prompt that just says that something inaudible's happened on the other end, and then, um, yeah, ask them to respond to it. It's sort of an impossible uh, choice, and we, there's no way that we can say that the player is making a decision here in the sense of like a strategic decision in a game. So although we're using a fairly um, traditional or conservative kind of like paradigm and structure, um, we're always kind of looking for interesting ways to experiment formally uh, within this framework. Here's um, something from, again, from Act 4 of the game. There's a few different things going on here. Um, one thing is that there are two conversations happening simultaneously, and um, between these two characters, we're getting each of their perspective on the conversation. So while one side of the conversation, the um, player is making dialogue choices, on the other side, the player is making choices about what that character is thinking about what the other person said, or what they're remembering, or what they're doing with their hands. 
Um, another thing that's happening here is this sort of uh, dimmer italic text. So we have italic text up here. Um, you can get kind of half of it where it says specimens, a spotted brown cap, and so on. Um, that text is the same semantically as, as this text on the right that's stage directions, right? Um, and then below it, I don't know if you can tell the difference in value, but below this uh, stage direction, we have another block of text that's a little bit fainter, um, that's also in italic. And this is a type treatment that we use consistently in the game to indicate that this block of text is a character's memory or um, part of their inner monologue or something that's being inserted in a way that you wouldn't really have uh, using the metaphor of like a stage play. You wouldn't really insert the, the character's inner thoughts in there. Um, it gets pretty dense in this scene, you know, when you have the two columns and these kind of three different uh, modes of, of text. Um, this is a uh, kind of recent edition of The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Um, so using, uh, using these insertions of, of italic text to indicate a shift in, in kind of mode or a shift in the context of, of um, the, the prose is something that, I mean, it happens in a lot of books, but a really famous example of it is in, in Sound and the Fury. Um, it's a book uh, that covers a lot of different moments in the history of a, a family. And uh, in the edition that was available, for, you know, since it was published in uh, 1929 up until about five years ago, um, though the only indication that we were switching time periods in the middle of a chapter or something is that we'd have a block of italic text to sort of interrupt the flow and give you, give you a sense of, oh, something is changing here. You'd have to reorient yourself. Um, you'd have to do that kind of analytical work, but you would get a cue that something was changing. Well, that was a, actually a kind of a compromise that Faulkner made with his publisher. His original vision for the book was that each one of these uh, shifts in, in time or shifts in perspective uh, would, be, would correspond with a different color of type. And in 1929, this was like, I guess, out of the question, but um, uh, in 2012, it's, it's not so difficult to do. So um, this is an edition of the, a recent edition of the book. Um, printed by the Folio Society in, in 2012. Also, it has this cool bookmark, which um, in addition to kind of being a key for the different colors and what they mean, uh, also has this neat, you can kind of like lay it across the text and it has a quick reference, like a ruler for the line numbers if you're reading like a concordance or something that goes along with it. Um, there's an, another recent book playing with, um, a, like printed book playing with colored type um, this is a book called House of Leaves. This is like a sort of horror, surreal, weird fiction kind of horror story um, from 2000 by Mark Danielewski. And in, in this book, uh, the word house is always printed in blue. Um, and there's another word, the word minotaur is always printed in red. Uh, it has a, it's a pretty creepy effect. Um, so this book, House of Leaves, um, is about a house that's bigger um, on the inside than it is on the outside. Um, but it's actually about a film about that house that's called The Navidson Record. That's a short film somebody made about that house, a documentary. Except actually the text of the book is a character named Zampano's analysis of the film, The Navidson Record, about the house. But then also it has, it's filled with footnotes from uh, this character named Johnny Truant, who has discovered Zampano's study of the Navidson record, except then it's actually also full of these footnotes by these characters called the editors who have collected Johnny Truant's um, analysis or collection of Zampano's study of this film about this house. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated, um, uh, murky uh, text. And at some points, those different layers kind of cross over with each other in, in weird and unsettling ways. The book uses a lot of extended techniques in printing. So um, this, uh, yeah, lots of footnotes, like I said, kind of strange footnotes, some footnotes that don't correspond to anything. Um, there's this one chapter that's, that's really bizarre. I think it's chapter eight that's full of, you know, yeah, text that's upside down and at different angles. 
um, there's this kind of really interesting thing where, some, where this text here is reversed because this is what's on the other side that sort of breaks this contract uh, that the page will always be opaque, right? This is kind of a strange treatment. It, at some moments, it, it looks like uh, actually like concrete poetry or visual poetry. Um, just to uh, um, give some context for concrete or, or visual poetry, this is a, a poem by Guillaume Apollinaire. Um, another, this is a, another poem that's good for Bergen called It Rains. And in, in this um, poem, we have this several phrases that, uh, you know, they're falling like raindrops. A, a kind of common thing with 20th century concrete poetry is uh, this sort of really direct uh, visual metaphor to the subject matter of the, of the poem. But it's also kind of nice that uh, this poem doesn't really uh, enforce any kind of specific starting point. You could read any one of these lines, um, you know, in any order. Um, this book, Writing Machines, by uh, and Catherine Hales from 2002, has some really great writing about House of Leaves and, and also about some other works. Um, she talks a lot about this book also, uh, which is called A Human Mint, um, which uh, written by this English, uh, or sort of created, I should say, by this English artist painter named Tom Phillips. Uh, I think he started in 1970 or so, and he's continued to revise it. It's, it's up to, I think it's sixth edition, and each edition is different from the previous ones. Um, this, the process for generating this book kind of recalls the uh, cut-up process of Tristan Tsar and the Dadaists, right, where, so he's taken another book, a book called A Human Document, and sort of painted over, selectively obscured the text to create new sentences in it, right? Uh, so it's like visually really interesting with collage and painting, obscuring the words. And then textually it's kind of interesting, um, you know, the, the sort of new, um, new narrative that he is able to create just by um, uh, not erasing certain parts. As an interesting game that he, uh, the writer, plays with himself here, um, the main character in his new narrative is uh, this character named Tog, right here, the T-O-G-E. Tog is actually kind of an uncommon combination of four letters, so this character Tog can only be referred to by name on a page where the word alt, or the word together or all together are used. So that was kind of an interesting, playful approach to the writing. Um, this book is also very uh, multi-layered, um, as Catherine Hales dissects it in a really interesting way in, in her book, again, Writing Machines. Um, but this, this book is also uh, has a lot of layers of different stories happening at once. Um, so there's the original story that Tom Phillips is kind of defacing, which is itself a story about um, a person, a narrator, who finds somebody's documents, uh, like somebody's old letters, um, in an attic, and those letters have notes written on them. The letters are, are um, it's somebody's, actually somebody's diary, a man's diary, and then notes by the woman, uh, his lover, uh, written into the margins of it, and then this narrator who found this document's sort of analysis and commentary on it. Um, so yeah, like House of Leaves, it's got several different layers, um, which is something that Catherine Hales calls remediation. So remediation in this case, not uh, the root of this word isn't remedy, the root of this word is media. Um, so it's about one medium being fed through another medium. Um, she says that the kind of formal treatment of these books as printed texts, uh, both Human Mint and House of Leaves, um, being kind of really formally inventive, she says that's a sort of necessary, um, it's a sort of, a t it's, it's a tightly bound feature with, their, with uh, their content as stories that are about remediation, about one uh, medium kind of consuming or translating another one. Uh, in the case of House of Leaves, you know, there's a film being translated through, an essay being translated through a novel. Uh, at the beginning of that, in fact, there's a house, which is a kind of medium being translated through all these things. Um, we do a lot of this in, oh man, you can't see that at all. I should have picked a better screenshot, but we do a lot of this in Kentucky Route Zero, this, this remediation. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, films uh, in the game that, that we sort of present only as text, describing the characters watching them or thinking about them or analyzing them. Um, there are, there's a game within the game that gets kind of remediated through, this game is a, is a um, parser-based text adventure called Xanadu, but the um, player plays it through our text system, which is multiple choice, controlling these characters, 
Uh, and in fact, the player doesn't directly choose what the characters type. The player chooses the dialogue options in conversation where the players are discussing what they should type next. Um, this uh, screenshot that you can barely see is from one of the interludes between episodes of the game. Uh, the second one is called The Entertainment. This was a sort of um, first person VR adaptation of a play that we wrote. So this is another case of, of remediation. But to so go back for a moment to House of Leaves and this, um, this word house, um, it's really an eerie and interesting experience to uh, be reading this book and then come across just this one a uh, word that's colored differently, or, or these two words, although the word minotaur is, is more rare than the word house comes up more often. Um, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it kind of gives the word um, more power, uh, especially because the word on its own normally is so mundane. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's a kind of eerie experience that we uh, borrowed in our game. Um, there's a, a sort of accident of the way that we treat text in the game. We started making this game in uh, 2010 or so, like I said, so um, we were using the Unity engine, but we started on, I think, Unity 2.6 or something like that, really, really old version of the Unity engine. Uh, at, at that time, the Unity engine could handle text and everything, but it couldn't do bold text and it couldn't do italic text that wasn't part of their text handling system, which is now really robust, but at the time it was very basic. Um, so in order to even have bold text, which we asked ourselves, do we really need bold text? You know, we were thinking, well, you know, is this on the critical path? Do we need, yes, okay, we definitely need bold text. Um, and the reason that we needed bold text is because we wanted to use this um, stage play treatment and we wanted the names of the characters to stand out. Uh, we needed italics to make the stage direction stand out and so on. Uh, so we had to build this system to let us show uh, text with these different treatments kind of all mixed together. And we built something that looks a, a little bit like if, um, if you've ever done any printmaking or seen a letter press, right? You have all the letters arranged and in a grid, you know, and you might do, if you're gonna do a multiple, or, or if you've done any screen printing, printmaking a lot of, you know, with a lot of techniques, I guess, um, you'll do multiple passes, right? And you just have to do multiple passes for different colors or, uh, and so on different, different screens. Um, and the important thing is just registering them so that they all align on the, on the medium that you're printing on. Um, so our text is rendered in, in passes and we, rent, we do a, you know, a regular font pass, we do a bold pass, an italics pass, and then it was so natural at that point to generalize the treatment of text to just do other passes um, using whatever other kind of distinctions we could make. And so uh, for us, it ended up being that there's really no distinction between a different font or a font variant and a different graphics shader on the type. Uh, so there are a lot of cases in the game where, um, where, there, where we're kind of mixing these, these rendering modes and these graphics shaders within a paragraph. And the one that uh, I wanted to call out that um, was directly inspired by House of Leaves is that whenever the word zero appears, uh, it looks like clouds are passing over it. And this is called the spooky shader. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. I sort of barreled through it. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think, I think we have about 20 minutes or something left in the, in the hour. So um, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll... Uh, Leave it to microphones. Hey, I got two questions. If that's, if that's okay. Sh sure. Uh, the first one is: if you're going to think about story, a game that you write a story for and have dialogue, would you like focus more on the story for the game, or will you think of to have the focus be this, the game mechanics itself? Um, the would I focus more on a story or a mechanic in a game? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm not a very systems-oriented designer, and, and neither are the two guys that I collaborate with. You know, especially in, in Kentucky Red Zero, our, our focus is on on kind of tone and and um, uh, characterization and stuff like that, atmosphere and pacing. So, um, but 
you know, that's not to say that we, we don't use a lot of systemic kind of simulationist stuff. Like I was talking about this at the beginning of the talk, this procedural text generator. There's a lot of stuff like that in the game. Um, when you're traveling by river, the river is being kind of like dynamically generated in front of you. Um, and a lot of this stuff is fed by uh, different dialogue decisions you've made and stuff. There's a lot of systems at play. They don't uh, present themselves so much as mechanics as they do. Uh, they present themselves as kind of eerie moments <laughs> or sort of like uh, aesthetic treatments. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard for me to, to distinguish between those in my practice, in our practice. Um, it's hard for me to think about mechanics as a separate category from, you know, if, I mean, if we're thinking of mechanics as like systems design, it's hard for me to think of that as a separate category from, from story writing. And as okay. for the second question, yeah. when you showed us the picture of the different kind of dialogues and the options you have, do you have to write like, uh, when it comes to writing, what you need to have in it? Do you, like write, do you have to change the entire dialogue with each option you choose or? Do you have to write a different, like... Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to write branching dialogue, and uh, uh, there's no one way that... There's no one method that uh, persists throughout the game. So, you know, a lot of those choices... Um, I don't know. I just it's hard because, as you say, it can it can branch and branch and branch, and it can be another kind of combinatorial explosion. Uh, and when you're writing those dialogue options, you're basically writing checks that you're going to have to cash later in some form or another. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of ways to deal with that. Sometimes it's really important to me that these moments be genuinely branch. You know, um, uh, usually. Uh, usually that's not, like I said, so much about giving the player decision-making points. Usually it's more about uh, uh, letting the player follow their curiosity or, or um, uh, you know, balancing, like, I, maybe I have two different stories I want to tell, and in this way I get to tell both of them. Um, but uh, then in some cases it's not important to me at all that the, the branching uh, persist or, or kind of be fleshed out. In some cases I'll give the player three options and then no matter what they pick, somebody else interrupts them before they can finish talking or something like that. It's like, it's enough to let the player read all those three options because they, they get information just from seeing the options, right? It's almost, um, almost like they're seeing the, the character's thoughts, like Martin was talking to me about the, how it felt, feels sometimes like you're seeing the character consider all the different things that they could say. And that's information about the, about the character, you know. Okay, there's somebody up in the front here too. When making a game that is so heavily weighted on what you say in tone, do you ever fear that it sort of varies into becoming more of a visual novel than an actual video game? And is that even a problem? Yeah. No, I don't fear that at all, and I, I don't make a distinction. Um, yeah, I don't make that distinction. <laughs> um, I, you know, video games are uh, like, you know, the group Tale of Tales, the game designers Tale of Tales had this really interesting, um, uh, manifesto that they wrote when they were writing a lot of manifestos where they said uh, video games are not games. I always thought that was a really interesting provocation, um, you know, to think uh, video games don't necessarily have to be games in, in the sense that they, they don't have to function or, or behave like, um, like rules-based card games or something like that. They can be a different category of experience. So, um, or, and they can be both, and they can go back and forth. And there's a lot of room for that. So yeah, I don't really distinguish between visual novels and games, I guess. Um, yes. Um, so when you random generate a lot of uh, content and experiment with text, I presume you throw voice acting out the window. But uh, what is a good, like, replacement for that. Do you have any approach to how you would do that? Because not every game is an 8-bit game where it would fit with like the typical dot dot sound. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't use voice acting in this game. Um, and part of that is these kind of techniques, you know, extended techniques that we w wanted to use with generating text with kind of uh, some of the text even before we started using this scramble templates is kind of fitted together in chunks depending on choices. But another reason that we don't use voice acting is because of interesting uh, typographic experiments like this. We're really kind of interesting and interested in the, the text as, as a material on its own. So uh, we don't want to encourage people to tune it out or something. Cool. I think. 
I don't know how much time we have left, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Hello. Okay, cool. okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a question about uh, the design process you guys take per act. I really enjoy the game. I love it. But I stopped playing it act two because I want to wait until it's done. Um, do you plot out each chapter in advance or are you just experimenting? I'm up here, by the way. Yeah, so I was looking <laughs> for you. I'd get, yeah, yeah, I got you now. Are, okay. you, are you plotting it all out in advance or are you just sort of, like, it seems like you're taking a lot of experimentation per yeah. act so. Yeah, totally. It, it's a mix of both. So we, um, we, we plotted some things out because it, that, um, that way we can do things like foreshadowing and stuff like that, and we can make, you know, um, make decisions that are, that are pointing us in a certain direction, make long-term decisions and stuff. But we try to leave as much as possible until the last moment, and, and, or not the last, until the last moment. We try to leave as much as possible until the moment that we're executing it. And um, the reason for that is that... Um, I, I think I can speak for all three of us working on the game that we, we don't really get a lot of ideas uh, out of nothing. We mostly get ideas from working, you know, uh, working with the material of code or the material of text, or sound, and image. So um, that's, that's where the interesting stuff is really going to come up anyways during the execution. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned old text-based adventure games. Yeah. Do you think there is uh, still room for the type of raw text input in modern games oh, instead yeah. of the dialogue option approach? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think it's actually experiencing uh, kind of a, a renaissance right now, maybe a second or third or fourth renaissance right now. Um, I think the, some tools like, uh, like Twine and Ink and some of these other um, hypertext authoring tools that have become very popular with independent game designers have brought people into looking at text uh, more closely. Uh, and some of those people have found existing communities like the IF Comp or these are um, interactive fiction communities that have been around um, since the one or two uh, text renaissances ago in the late 90s um, and, and found that these people have this really robust dialogue that they've developed and documented very well about how to use text in games and stuff. So um, yeah, parsers are super interesting. I haven't worked with them uh, very much, but yeah, there's a, there's a really interesting thing that I think you do to a player when you ask them to write the words out, whether, you know, whether the whether you're adding mechanical flexibility or not, which you, you certainly can um, with a parser system, add a lot of mechanical flexibility and complexity. Whether you're doing that or not, though, just the, um, just the physical action of, of having the player write, I think, does something very different to the experience. So, Cool. Is that, uh, sorry, I, yeah. Uh, hi again. Hi. So in your game, uh, I, I've seen some clips of it and stuff. I haven't played it yet. It uh -huh. looks very interesting. But also, I think I'll wait till the final episode is out before I try it. Yeah, cool. Uh, I've seen that there are parts where you have this text dialogue trees mixed with music. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of wondering, how, how do you make that? How do you oh, yeah, right. make a, a, ran, a almost randomly generated song since the user can choose right, their yeah. inputs. You're talking about this moment, uh, or there's a couple of moments like this, but, but probably the one where um, the characters are in a bar and they're watching this woman sing, and, um, and the player sort of picks the next line in the song, and it's all synced up, and it was really hard to do. Um, but uh, it, yeah, that, that's, um, uh, I don't know, technically, there's some, we, we have a few different loops that we can go back and forth between. We look to see if the player's made a choice and if they haven't within a certain deadline, we queue up a sort of holding loop that plays another measure. Um, we looked actually at um, the Curse of Monkey Island, the third Monkey Island game had a, a scene like this where you're on a pirate ship and you're trying to trick the pirates. They're really lazy. You're trying to trick them into working, but they just want to sing. So you there's this moment where you're contributing lines to their song, trying to derail them. So we, we were uh, looking at, the, at that scene and, and just tried to um, replicate the interaction. It's really funny there, and in our game, it's not, it's not so funny. It's sort of moody <laughs> and sort of melancholy. Um, but yeah, one, one thing, working with electronic text the, uh, as a real-time phenomenon, um, we can do stuff like interact with other real-time phenomena, like animation and, and sound. You know, um, we, we, 
always try to tr treat text in the game with the understanding that it's unfolding in real time. You're not opening up a page in a codex or something. It's being typed out character by character. Different characters pause for different lengths before printing out the next character uh, in order to give it some semblance of, of um, you know, syntactic or human speech or something. So like the period at the end of a sentence pauses for longer than, than other characters, commas pause for different lengths. And one reason that I totally abused the ellipsis, the three dots uh, in the writing for this game is that it's like a really nice duration of a pause in the middle of dialogue too. Yeah. Cool. Okay, maybe one more, I think. Uh, hi, uh, really fascinating presentation. Um, I, I was just wondering, uh, it seemed like you know a lot about the subject, but um, are there, do you have any games you would uh, point out to us or recommend purely for the use of text alone? Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of, of great work done with Twine and, um, or, or with parsers. There, I, actually, let me recommend you some um, it's easy to find a lot, of, a lot of good indie twine games, but let me recommend some parser games to you. Um, uh, so there's a game called Coloratura um, by Linnea Glasser, I believe is her last name. I'm mixing that up. Um, anyway, so yeah, Coloratura is a, is a game about being an alien consciousness on a ship. It's sort of like an alien movie, um, you know, like the movie Alien, except you're playing from the perspective of the alien, but it's not like a violent horror thing. It's, it's uh, about this sort of confusion, bafflement of the alien, and um, it uses color in a really interesting way, and um, it's, it's a really good, good game. And then another game, uh, another interesting parser game is, um, um, oh god, I'm totally blanking on it, Photopia by um, Adam Cadre is his name, C-A-D-R-E. Um, Photopia is a, another game that's kind of about color and uses colored text. An interesting way, and and that's a really accessible game. Both of those actually are really great games to start with if you haven't used a parser interface for playing interactive fiction before. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much.